Oh, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. No, hold it a minute. Yeah. Takes time, you know, we're still... Our My name is Brian Bowden, and I come from West Warwick, the Rhode Island. It's a small town south of Providence, and I was born there in 1917. Uh, you're doing very good. My name is Brian Bowden. I'm from West Warwick, Rhode Island. I was called to active duty in, in August of 1943. I had already been to Georgetown Medical School and graduated and had a year of internship. So I was ready to go in the Army because I was a member of the ROTC. In fact, I've got 29 years with the ROTC in active Army. So when I was called, I, I didn't like the orders at all. The orders were sending me to uh, uh, Camp Lewis in Washington. And I didn't want to go there because I figured I'd be going to the uh, Pacific. So when I went to the uh, field, Medical Field Service School, uh, but oh, about that time, about a week after I got, in, I got called, uh, a parachute medical officer came to all the classes. There were 1,600 doctors there. And he came to all the classes and he was looking for volunteers. So he told, told us that he would be at the uh, gym that night and he would see anybody, he would explain, there'd be a film and everything else. So out of those 1,600 doctors, 400 showed up. And uh, they had uh, the film, and, and then about, there was about 100 left after that. After he showed all the paraphernalia for jumping, it left 12. Out of those 12, four were taken, and I was one of them. But because I went there on that night, my orders were changed completely, and I was sent to uh, uh, to parachute school, which was in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was there for four weeks. And from there, I was sent to the 508 Parachute Infantry in uh, North Carolina. And not Fort Bragg, but uh, Camp McCall, North Carolina. Uh, from then on, uh, it was a little regular training and everything else, and uh, uh, we were slated to uh, uh, go overseas, so I knew that. I uh, spoke to a lot of the old boys who had been in the Tennessee maneuvers. In fact, when I got there at 4 o'clock in the morning, there used to be an old bag that was covered with mud from the Tennessee maneuvers. <laughs> I didn't like that too much, but anyway. Uh, we were called, we went to Camp Shanks, New York. And uh, on Christmas Eve, we were allowed to go, well, Christmas Eve, and then, night before we were allowed to go downtown, but we weren't allowed to go with boots. We had to go with blouse, with pants weren't blouse, no insignia, nothing like that, which was fine. Then we went to, uh, by boat, uh, to Staten Island, where we took a ferry to Weehawken and then took the boat to go overseas. We got to Belfast uh, nine days later. And from Belfast, uh, we went to a place called Port Stewart, North Island, near Port Rush. And uh, we, we were there stationed there about uh, six months or so prior to going to, uh, to England. We went there by boat, and uh, we were stationed at, uh, uh, hold it. I was stationed in Nottingham, which is real close to Sherwood Forest, and uh, we trained there for about six months or more, and we've had two uh, training jumps. One training jump, both of them were at night, by the way, getting us ready for the for D-Day, and uh, one night we went to the, uh, the field, and uh, it was raining, so we could not go up right away. We had some sea rations. We had sick as could be on it when he got up in the plane. I, I threw up in a, in a can, <laughs> and I looked down on my back. Then the guy hit me, we're going out, you know. I usually went out number two, man. However, this time I found myself about number 13. And when I went out, it was, my legs were all over the place, you know. Usually you, you count three, but that time your parachute should open. 
and you go down at about 70 feet per second. So that's pretty fast. Well, anyway, I landed pretty hard, and uh, I had pains in my calves right away. So I started walking, met another guy, we're walking ahead, all at once he disappears. Where are you? He was down in the hole because it's a bombing range they dropped us on. Get him out of there. A few, day, a few minutes later, I get bounced on my back because I hit into a wire fence. <laughs> and then we met more of our men and we began to, you know, get all those who had been hurt, take care of them. And uh, pretty soon, a man, tall fellow, we looked like he had a first lieutenant's bar, and he comes up to me and he tells me, well, how'd you make out? And I told him what I thought anybody who would drop us in a place like that. The chaplain had a broken leg, you know. So he was accommodating, you know, he had one of those phosphorescent things, he was a referee. So I told him what I thought and he disappeared. I saw him again at 5.30 in the morning. He didn't see me. He was the commanding general, Lieutenant, Ga Lieutenant General Gavin. Well, not Lieutenant General Gavin, but he was then uh, a Gavin, Brigadier General Gavin. Yeah. So that was uh, the first one. The second one uh, wasn't bad at all, so uh, I, I didn't get hurt anyway, except to get strained muscles, and that's about all. Then when D-Day came, we were sent to Falkingham Air Base, and everybody got ready there to put in black stuff sort on their faces and uh, loading up the planes. By the way, one plane exploded because a bundle exploded, killed a few by men. That was uh, well, a bad setback. Then we got going, and uh, uh, early in the morning, I'd say, well, no, it was late at night, 11 o'clock at night, and uh, we went south to the uh, Guernsey and Jersey Islands, saw a submarine light over there, and we turned left, went across the peninsula, Normandy Peninsula, and we were dropped at about 2 o'clock. The big problem was that we were dropped as one of the later battalion, later regiments that dropped. So when the first ones dropped, they were not expected. When we were coming, they, we were expected. And believe me, we were hit by everything else but the kitchen sink. You can't imagine the maelstrom of activity when you're dropping out of a plane at about 500 feet, 17 feet per second, and you don't know where you are or what, but you see planes crashing down, uh, staccato rhythm from the fires, the cannons and everything else. And uh, I was a particular, you know, I wasn't afraid. I was just apprehensive, that's all. And I could see these uh, uh, blue and tan uh, bullets coming by, those are, I can't remember what they call now, but I was moving my feet to get away from them and all that, so I went right through an apple tree at a lousy uh, way to land, but I landed on my feet, my rear end on my head, and I, and I couldn't get out of my chute because uh, the grommets were so tight, so I had already put a knife in a little pocket over here, and I took it out, opened it up, and sawed my way up, then I I was in a hedge room, so about 2 o'clock in the morning, everything as dark as could be, so I didn't know what to do, so I took out my uh, compass and I got my directions and I went in one direction and I was going along the edge of the hedge row and uh, by, by the way, we were told not to fire. It was pretty hard for me to shoot my morphine syrette, I didn't have a gun, but I did have a dagger. So I started along this hedge row, it was about a a quarter moon, so nothing could be seen in my direction because the moon is over there. So I could see this guy coming with his rifle and going slowly, you know. And I, I said to myself, I better do something about this. If I don't protect myself, I'll kill him. He's going to kill me and there's a lot of people depending on me. So I put the knife down to my boot and I waited for him to get there. And uh, I gave him the password. And he started the back so slow I knew he was coming up on him. So he was a new replacement and he seemed to be awfully nervous. So I told him, follow where he was going and I'd take care of myself. The next time I went through a, 
big, seemed to be a big gully where the cows went in. And I went there, and I couldn't even see my hand from my face. I couldn't see a thing. So I backed out of there, went down another side of a hedgerow. <clears throat> then suddenly I heard this heavy, like heavy boots coming, like that. And I you know, got a lot of little brush in there. So I got there, I set my knife, and I said, flash. Password was thunder. There was no answer, and I hit out, and I hit nothing. To this day, I think I challenged the cow, and the cow was so nervous she couldn't move. <laughs> so soon after that, I got challenged by the by this fellow who had jumped ahead of me. This fellow was layman. He's right here, and uh, <clears throat> he challenged he challenged me and a few others. We got together with a few eight men, myself, and a few infantry men, and he told us. He said. When you hit the ground, when you go shot at, he said, fix bayonets. When you hit the ground, make sure you got plenty of room. Well, we got shot at, of course, and we, they hit the ground, and this guy put his gun in this direction and caught Lehman right here. That's why he's got a bandage on that. They caught him right there. Severed his uh, uh, facial artery. So it goes to the big carotid artery, goes to the brain. So he was losing a lot of blood would put a bandage on, but there wasn't enough. I had a clamp, and at first, the clamp was a two-part clamp. And when he moved his head, the clamp split, and then the doctor said, I don't know where it went. But I complained about that to the army afterwards, and they didn't have any more clamps, like it'd be just one, one piece. Anyway, we had to give plasma, so this Corporal Kwasnick and uh, Private Rupi and I went in different directions. Wasnick found a unit of plasma, brought it over, I gave it to him, and of course, you had nothing to hold it, so I had to hold it, so I was standing up with it. I, uh, I got shot at by a guy up at the top of a building, uh, but I had to give him plasma, so I got down on my haunches and I put my arm up there. I thought he was going to shoot the darn thing out of my hand, but fortunately, some of the infantrymen went after him and killed him. So then we. Uh, went to uh, uh, an area that we thought we would we'd belong to, but uh, we couldn't find anything there. So we found a, a house, a farmhouse, and it had a barn. An open, a barn was one level below the farmhouse itself, big uh, stone, and we put all our wounded in there. Well, we were given plasma, and it was getting better, but then I looked out the door, and out comes a bunch of Germans, and about Oh, maybe three, four hundred feet from us, but they knew that somebody was there. So they came down, and uh, before they came in, they rid the opening with a Schmeisser fire, the rapid fire, like a little machine gun. And uh, so then I took my hat, which had red crosses on it, and I stuck a pitchfork and handle at the end of it, and I stuck it out there. They shot again and then stopped. And they said, how the hook? You know, amped up. So they came in, they took my razor, <laughs> that's all they took from me. But then uh, they knocked on the door of the farmhouse. Nobody answered. They figured there must be somebody there, so they threw a potato mash in there, killed both women that were in there. So then they took us to a uh, uh, collecting station, German collecting station. And uh, as we got there, I had to carry myself 165 pounds. 25 years old, with another guy, much younger than I, Private Rupi. We got tearing over hill and dale, over walls and everything else, to this place. As soon as we got there, uh, one of the men saw me, and he said, uh, Freund, Roy Kreuz, we are friends. We're Red Cross. Wasn't that nice? Well, we got everything over there. We brought all our men there. Then they brought trucks and took us to this uh, uh, field hospital, they called it Felt Lazarette, the 91st Felt Lazarette. And they took us over there and put us into a wooden building. We got into this barracks. It was full of uh, double beds, I'd say maybe 40 or 50 double beds. Not double beds, double bunks with a straw mat. So we 
uh, I had three medics with me, so they took care of what the men where they belonged, and then the casualties began to come in. I was working for three days and two nights without stopping, carrying litters, taking care of the wounded, all kinds of wounded. And, uh, I laid down at 4 o'clock in the morning on the third night, and they woke me up again at 2 because so many coyotes were coming in, and there was no other doctor. The only other doctor was from my regiment, but he had a wound in his hip, and he couldn't help at all, of course. So we started to take care of them, and as I said, I just laid down, they woke me up again. I tried to get up, and I could not get up. I couldn't hold my head up. I had to roll off the bunk and then grab the end and then bring myself up. So that, to this day I've got fused vertebrae <laughs> in my neck. <laughs> anyway, we, we took care of all those men all for that period of time. Then I, I really needed to have a German surgeon. They had the hospital there had surgeons who operated all the time. I had to have a man come over and uh, do what they call triage. See, the men that they could possibly help for me. Some bad wounds, chest wounds, whatever. So this doctor showed up. He was a captain, Huff, Huffman. And uh, I was telling him about the different people around. One guy was shot in, in his lung, and he was lay, his head, his chest was all swollen because air was coming out. He's still living, by the way. His name was Coons. Then I got to this uh, captain. He was from headquarters, 82nd Airborne, yeah. and uh, he had both legs were all swollen, bluish. He could possibly stand him. It was a pain. We did morphine. That's all we could do. So I told him. I said, I'd like you to uh, take X-rays of this man, so he could have, you know, the cast put on and so forth. He looked at me. He said, Nix fractura meaning not fractured. I said, how do you know? Do you have x-ray eyes, you know? He says, I do not need x-rays. I am German medical officer. I said, bullshit. You can't put that on. I said, bullshit. And uh, he turned to me. He says, was ist das bullshit? I don't know what I answered, but I had a few nervous moments there. But he was a cooperative, and he did it quite a few of our men in there. And, uh, it was very helpful. He even got a layman in there also, and he sewed up the wound and everything else. So that after that, layman was very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> on about the third day that I had been there, I wanted to check on some of my men who were operated on. So I approached the chateau, which was where their surgery was. Maybe a hundred feet away. And as I approached it, I heard a, I thought I heard a shell coming. The shell exploded. I dove behind the sheltered wall and a medical officer, a German medical officer, was killed outright. And how I got this picture, I don't know. I mean, how I, I'm sorry, how I got the, uh, the cap, I don't remember, but I took it. And I've had it all this time, except I turned it over to uh, Camp uh, Fort Bragg in North Carolina with a lot of other stuff like that. So uh, all I'd say about, I was, I kept on telling my eight men, especially two of them, this was a chateau, it had at least three floors, I said, go as high as you can, leave only one at a time and see if you can see activity, American activity. So they did report to me they had seen a, uh, a man, <coughs> a soldier there with a 300 radio. They could see the antenna. So they knew we were being surrounded. So I, I thought, I'm okay. So then I went to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. They were trying to evacuate us. To Germany, evacuate all the people to Germany because they saw they were being surrounded. And uh, they had an ambulance that took only four litters, but ten men sitting. So when I saw that, 
I sent my medics out to pick up all the wood they could, and any kind of a piece of wood they could strap on a guy's leg, they did that. So instead of getting rid of four men at a time, I would, I would instead of getting ten men, I would make it only four. I sent three officers, four officers out at first, including the doctor, because I really wanted them to get definitive surgery, and they weren't going to get it there any more than they had. After that, I strapped more, I made splints on these people. So they were evacuating four instead of ten, so I had more and more able-bodied men left that they didn't know about. But I wanted to let the 82nd Airborne know, to let the Army know anyway, that we were there. So I, uh, I went, I collected a lot of sheets. I got them from the hospital from this German medic of mine, Frank Ruppie, and uh, we, set, we went out maybe 200 yards south of the hospital in a field, and we set up uh, sheets like this, layers of them, making two like this at a peak with a mark down the middle, two AAs that we put bricks and made a cross with bricks, and then another two AAs, which signified American troops 82nd Airborne medical installation. And believe it or not, a plane came by, a P-38, and I waved at it, we waved at it, and it dipped its wings. Three years after I came back out of the Army, I met a fellow a lawyer who was going to take care of my business, and uh, I mentioned that to him because he'd been a flyer. So he said, I said, do you remember anything like you ever see, hear anybody tell you that? He said, that was me. That was me. He said, I saw that. I'm the guy who dipped the wings. His name was uh, Arsenal, something like that. And I, he, I think he's still alive. So then, uh, the following day, a uh, field infantry officer, German officer, called me and wanted me to speak on a, an American field telephone to tell them to stop, you know, sending shells over there. And uh, I refused. Uh, I was pretty cocky then. But I couldn't do it anyway. I didn't know how to use the telephone. But I said, there's only one reason why the shells are coming here. You've got a battery of big guns right outside the perimeter of the hospital, and you're getting counter battery fire. If you get those out of there, you won't get any more shells. And oh, maybe five or six hours later, they were gone. So, something else also. Uh, about eight o'clock the following morning, I went to the German officer who was left. Most of them, the Big surgeons were gone, but they left one medical officer and uh, maybe uh, 50 or 60 men and uh, aides. And uh, I went to the uh, medical officer and I asked him to surrender because I said, you're being s surrounded by American troops would be your advantage to surrender now. He refused. But there was so much evidence later on that we were being surrounded I went back to him and I insisted that he surrendered. He did. He gave his gun. And uh, his uh, aide de camp gave uh, uh, Laban another gun. And not knowing this, but our men had more, as many guns as the Germans had because they were helping the Germans to take care of the German wounded. And in doing so, they'd slipped their weapons in their pockets. So we were pretty well healed. And so. Anyway, the next morning uh, we saw some men coming down the road and I stepped out of the chateau and I put my hands up like this and it was the 4th Infantry Division coming from the beach. So actually, we were not relieved by anyone else, but we, you know, they were coming anyway. We just happened to, to be in charge at the time. From there we went to a by jeep. We had seven men on a jeep, I think. We went to, we were going to a place called saint sauveur le vicomte which was about three miles away. And uh, 
before we got there, we were strafed. We saw American planes flying over us, and suddenly one of them detaches itself, and it's dive bombed and blows up a truck, and we all jumped out of there. How we got out all in one piece, I don't know. But it was a German who had a uh, he had captured airplane, and he got into the formation. And I never knew more. what happened. After, I'm sure he didn't live that day. So we went. Uh, we went back, but before we got back. I, I was stopped. This is where this picture was taken. This picture was taken, and also this picture right here. Both these pictures were taken by Acme Photo. After that was done, we went and we reported to uh, our units, you know, with the 508 parachute infantry. The next thing that went on, we were sent across the river Douve in rubber boats. And we were glad to get across because we've been shy to have the rubber boats that don't uh, stay up very well. And we uh, went to this place and uh, we set up camp there. And uh, one, one, two, maybe two hours later after we got there, a plane, a spotter plane came by, an L-5 spotter plane, and unfortunately it came by at the same time that this friend of mine told the 81 million motor squad to send up some motor shells and caught the plane. I have the plane picture here. There it is right here. This is a picture of the plane. And I, I simply ran to it, I was so close. And found both men were dead. Three years after that, three or four years after that, I went to a funeral in Fall River and I was talking to my uh, cousin who was a, uh, uh, a, also a veteran. And I was telling him about this, I don't know why, because he said he had been in the Air Corps. And, do you know that he is the man who ordered that plane up? He is the man who ordered the plane up. So there's two coincidences already. On a day following that episode, we uh, went into a town called Prato, P-R-E-T-O-T. And uh, I had my, uh, I had no aid station. I simply had a bunch of men in the gutters alongside the road going to the town. And uh, General Gavin went by with his rifle upside down on his shoulder and he came back, waved and everything else. Nothing happened, but every time I'd get on the road, I'd get shot at. And I was wondering why. And so was this uh, major who came down the road from my own unit, and he said, what are you going down there for? Well, I said, uh, put my helmet on, you'll see why. He puts my helmet on, he got shot at. There was <laughs> a sniper was shooting at the Red Cross. They had orders to kill all the medics. The German had given orders to kill all the medics that you can, because then you deprive them of their aids, of their aid men. The day after that, we went towards a place called Hill 131, and, uh, which is where Lehman was killed finally. But I was called to send some aid men there because they were getting a lot of casualties. Very difficult place to uh, assault. And uh, I looked around and I took my mirror, looked at myself, I said, you go, I was the only one there. So I left and uh, I asked where uh, this certain uh, uh, officer had been uh, shot and he was waiting for me and I went down this road, uh, then into a field and uh, I was crouching and running, crouching and running. Finally I found myself between the Germans and the Americans and I was in an untenable position, I had to get out. So I threw myself to the ground and I started to crawl back to where I came from. 
And believe it or not, I could see the blades of grass falling. They were cut by it. Yeah. I was so afraid my rear rent was the biggest part of me that I was moving it. I was afraid I'd get hit. But uh, lucky I did not get hit. But then as just as I came out of the field, a man was going by me. He was uh, wounded in his head and he blood all over him. And uh, I hit him head on and knocked him off his feet. I know he didn't want it. That's not the kind of first aid that he wanted. But all he had was a bullet wound that went just touched the tip of his head and the veins, of course, they bleed. He like a, uh, that old paint ad, you know. <laughs> he was covered with it. Uh, the day after that it was one of the uh, real, well, I'm sorry, again that day we went, we were advancing a little bit further and uh, too fast, in fact, because the Germans were raining cannon shots on us, and the Americans were dropping their shells also. So we had with us a, a first lieutenant and a sergeant. The sergeant had on his field radio, big batteries, and uh, the uh, lieutenant called back to headquarters, lift your fire. You're, we're, we're ahead of the other troops that should be even with us. And uh, they did, but unfortunately the Germans were listening. And when they saw that, they knew where we were, where we was. And an 88 shell dropped among us. I was flat on my stomach trying to dig onto myself with a couple of other officers and enlisted men. And uh, the shell exploded, and right after it did, I looked up, and I saw a head in a helmet going up in the air into the next field. It was the sergeant who had the field radio. And the lieutenant was dead, and uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Captain Brennan, was saying, how can I live with my guts hanging out? And uh, I crawled over to him, and I examined him, and uh, I could see that he was spurting blood from his left thigh. I put a bandage on that, a good tight bandage, and I said, Mal, you're not bleeding from your, your abdomen. I looked at his abdomen, he was all contused from the battery, the battery, the big battery that hit him in the abdomen, so he thought that his guts were hanging out. He, he had his hand over like that. So we fixed him up and got him going out of there. Uh, this went on and on. The following day was a very sad day for me because I left the man I had made a good friendship with. Uh, he's the man in this picture. Lieutenant Lehman. And, uh, he was hit by shrapnel, he dropped to the ground. Colonel Mendez, the battalion commander, picked him up, put him on his shoulder, and was trying to get him out of the way when a sniper shot Lehman on the colonel's shoulder. formerly of the 508 Parachute Infantry, 82nd Airborne Division. I've already appeared before the camera on my experiences in Normandy. Now I'd like to take you to Holland and about General Montgomery's grandiose effort to turn back the Germans by going to Holland and then going to the top of the Holland area, going to the right, if you're looking at the map, and going down into the Ruhr Valley to destroy the Germans there. Unfortunately, it was a failure because when the British landed in Harden, which is right above Nijmegen, where I landed, they were right among two SS German divisions that began to decimate them. And they nearly never got a chance. They were some of the best troops. They were all heroes, they were real fighters. They killed an awful lot of Germans, but they never could liberate the bridge so that the British forces coming up 
from Eindhoven in that area could come up to Nijmegen, take that bridge, and go up. So the British and Polish had no chance at all, and that is why the whole thing failed. Uh, out of the 10,000 Britishes, only 2,323 survived, and I met a few of them. They were really pathetic. I may have mentioned it uh, to someone else, but uh, not now, that Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands was also in the army, and in spite of that, he was never asked for his advice on the way that the troops were supposed to go. So he, he, would have had, he would have given him a better chance. So what happened is that at 13, 30 hours on 9th 17, 44, on a beautiful day, with a lot of flack, but a very nice trip. <laughs> Took about three and a half hours to get there. And uh, the 508 uh, was, uh, oh, I'd say maybe one of the first ones of the 82nd to go down. And uh, as, we, as my chute opened, and I was able to see where I was coming down. I noticed a big uh, uh, flak battery down below me, surrounded by wire. There were three of them grouped together. And I, to this day, I don't remember whether uh, I actually heard the fire, but I know that when I was getting ready to land, they were not firing, and I maneuvered my chute so that I could land right outside of the wire. And I did. And as I landed, I stood up and I touched the wire and about five guys approached me, surrendering. And of course, we were surrendering all over the place. They could see they would never survive. They'd be decimated, they'd be captured or whatever. So they had to give up. So, oh, I'd like to, I was going to tell you about when we left there, but I wanted to also tell you a very sad experience that one of our officers had, Lieutenant Mitchell. He was shocked, but the bullet entered his uh, phosphorus grenade at his belt, and the phosphorus began to come out. You can imagine what happened there. He died an awful death. From there, we, we walked about uh, two miles to a place called Bertigal, which is really is a resort area for the people from uh, Nijmegen. And uh, I found a house there, a very nice house, uh, and, uh, and covered trees all over the place, a good place to have an aid station. And uh, I was greeted by the people who lived there. The, the man who owned it was a, a banker, and his oldest son was in the Dutch underground. So after we got our stuff out there and got ready to receive casualties, I said, you know, I have no no transportation. So he said, well, he said, there might be some cars around that, you know, people have left and left them there. So he got on his motorcycle, and I got behind him, and he went down the road looking for a car. And sure enough, within a matter of 20 minutes, a few miles away, we found a, uh, a late model Oldsmobile, four-door Oldsmobile. Oh, it's ideal, but how do you get it started? Well, he fiddled around, and he crossed two wires under the drive, drive under the post, you know, under the, the dash. Crossed them together, started the car. And uh, I don't know where we obtained gas, but uh, with that car we managed to pick up some casualties that uh, the aid men had put by the road, you know, we brought them to our aid station, or to the hospital. And then there was a, uh, a collecting uh, station not too far up the road, in fact, it was a, a field hospital, and one, one of my friends was in that field. He, he saw my name come in on so many dog tags, you know, uh, and uh, I was wondering, it can't be that boat, because that guy never talked very much. He was a quiet fellow. He never get the parachute. Well, that was a surprise. I never did meet him there. So uh, we, we proceeded to... Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> I was with Lieutenant Schools, my assistant surgeon, 
and he wanted to drive that day, so we went from that Dutch area where the nurses were, and we were going down the road, and suddenly I noticed we were passing outposts. We went past our last outpost, we went to Germany. So I said, turn around. So he turns up this hill, Saul and Backman and the Costals. So it rolls back, we're trying to get the, the wires together, it's so damn nervous, it was so long, we couldn't get together very quickly, but we did, and we got out of there, okay. Now, the night prior to the next attack, uh, we were walking through the woods, of course, it's doctors, we don't see anything. Then what we're walking on, little branches and all that, we see these white robed people walking towards us, and you know, you're you're watching, what is this? They were members of an insane asylum that, you know, were, they, they got out and they were walking around, so that really scared us. Then uh, you would get a kick out of this. Uh, we had a collecting jeep, I got it with the driver, and we went up on the dikes at a place called Erlikorn. Now a dike, as you know, is a very much raised area the water may come in between, but usually they are, some of them are parallel, but others may come at an angle. We were coming on an angle, and we were going to turn on the next one, and right at the corner was a house. As he made the corner into the next road, we were facing a German tank, and there you could see the gun rising. He put it reverse so fast, and he moved back, and he, then he moved into the driveway of the house and he went, he went the other way. And we got away that way. That man never drove again. We got word that he, he was so scared that day he refused to drive. <laughs> now, a few days later, I was, uh, uh, I, being in the east station, I was in the back, you know, a couple of miles, a half a mile, whatever. Uh, depends on the fluidity of the, uh, the battle. And I thought I'd better go and see how things were going medically. So I, I walked about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, and then I began to cautiously go towards the battle. And uh, that by the time I got another two, three hundred yards, I noticed that uh, things were flying around me. So I was sort of hugging the ground and, and sometimes crawling up. And on this last crawl, I'm looking under a tank, and there were two Britishes there having tea. So I crawled a little bit further, and I came upon my commanding officer, my third battalion commander, and I discussed the situation with him, and then I went back. A little later, <clears throat> well, quite a bit later, I'd say, but we went uh, across after the bridge was taken. We went to a place called Bemmel, B-E-M-M-E-L, and uh, we were there attached to the 50th Division, British Division. And I had already settled in a, uh, as my aid station in the barn. The barn had potatoes, oh, maybe six or seven feet of potatoes grow, gradually going down. That's where I slept the night before, nice and soft. But uh, all they want is a furor. This uh, British officer comes in with this swag of stick, and uh, he says, I'm taking over. This, uh, I'm so and so, I'm taking over. You know. And, uh, so the guy says, it came to me, and I had no, it was cold at that time. I had no insignia, it wasn't showing up. So uh, I says, it's okay, fella, don't get your water warm. So we, he says, don't you talk to me like that. I am First Lieutenant Guthrie. I says, well, I'm Captain Boat. Get out of here. That's the last time I saw him. That's about, that's about it for Holland, uh, except to say that uh, it was entirely different than Normandy. And when I begin to talk to you about the bulge, that will be very much different also. When, when in that uh, those aircraft uh, in your invasion of Holland, how many GIs were in that airplane? H aircraft. How many did they? Well, you about 12 to 18, depending on what kind of uh, 
you know, kind Look, of before you jumped, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I thought I'd say about more. 18, probably. Yeah. About 18. But in, yeah. uh, in jump school, it was never more than 12. But, uh, but I thought, in, you know, in battle, it would be more than that for some reason. Well, uh, 42 planes went together. So you put them all together, that's quite a few, especially yeah. if you're uh, lifting with uh, gliders, you know. Did you experience any uh, the Germans shooting up at uh, uh, during your descent, uh, parachuting descent? During the parachute descent in Holland, no. But before we got there, the flak was terrific, and we were being buzzed just like bees by the German uh, fighters. But you weren't being shot at by ground fire. In oh yeah, descent. flak. That's what I meant by oh. flak. Oh yeah, that's in the air, right? Yeah, all yeah. Yeah, a few, a few planes were knocked down. Yeah. Not as many as in Normandy, uh, but uh, quite a few were knocked down. Okay. And then we're going, to, oh, we're going to go to the next one, right? Yeah, the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, actually, it's uh, the Ardennes. The Belgians, the mm -hmm. A R D E N N E S, that Belgium. Now, the 82nd Airborne had been back a very short time, six weeks or so, uh, went off on furloughs and everything else, and they didn't expect anything like this. But on the 17th of December, we were alerted at 2,000 hours, 8 o'clock, 8 p.m., part of the officers' club, to report to headquarters at, immediately that on the 16th, the day before, that the Germans had attacked, counterattacked the whole line. And of course, our line was very thinly held, our line is thinly held by the 106th Infantry Division and the 28th Infantry Division and the 7th Armored. And they went right through the, you know, they, they, had, they could not uh, stop them at all. So we were called to get over there and get there quickly. So <laughs> and there are 12 German divisions attacking. So we uh, were packed like sardines in these big trailer trucks. And I mean like sardines. We were so packed that we could not sit. We were all standing for 19 hours. And uh, it was very tiresome, so much so that uh, at one place called Ufeli's in Belgium, one of the men fell asleep standing up. And as he did, for some way or other, so tight, he had a grenade, and the grenade flew off. So it, it was caught practically in midair, and a guy closed it, and another guy and I picked him up and put him over the side so that he threw it off in the woods. Uh, that was the same thing going on for the 101st Airborne. They were following us, and they stopped uh, where, they, where they did, if you remember, <laughs> mm -hmm. where the nuts reply came from. So we went from there to a place called Wurgelmont, way over in the, in the hills. It was really very, very, very cold. Uh, my, uh, First aid station, one of the first aid stations was at a place called Garon, G A R O N, and it uh, was snowing heavily. It was very difficult to uh, take care of casualties there because of the deep snow, which was going to get deeper. But I had an aid station there, and I had a German medic helping me. At about 9 o'clock at night, there was a knock on the door. So I said, Fritz, answer the door. So he goes to the open and there's a guy standing there with a submachine gun. He lifts it up and says, hold it. Jeez, I didn't know. I never see a, come see a German there, you know. So I said, who are you looking for? He says, Captain Bowden. I said, that's me. He says, well, I've been on leave in West Warwick, Rhode Island, and I met your father in the clothing store. We've been working all these years. He said to look you up, you know, when he said, I have one. So I'm looking you up. Imagine that. Three years later, I met him coming out of a bank in West Warwick. We had never seen each other since, and we looked at each other. 
He said, Bowden? He said, you know, I, he said Bowden, I can't remember his name, was an Italian yeah. fellow. And, uh, <laughs> where's he saw him? No, uh, we were, uh, oh, this is uh, really interesting here. Yeah, the 24th of December, uh, we got word to get good, have a defensive withdrawal of the whole Lady Second Airborne. We were too far forward. The other uh, division could not keep up so that we were a threat, you know. So uh, we did uh, withdraw on the 24th. It was difficult because we had to leave a, a platoon from each uh, battalion to, as a, to watch out, you know, make sure they didn't infiltrate us. It worked out very well. We, we walked uh, for quite a few miles, I don't remember how many, but it was very, very, very cold. And we set up in a, in a place uh, called Villette, V-I-L-L-E-T-T-E, -E, an area, E-E-R-I-A, up on the hill, going up on the hill. And they were waiting for the Germans. It's very difficult, some sub-zero weather, to dig holes. But the guys did the best they could. They had a very nice uh, uh, series of holes there with uh, mines being laid at the same time, waiting for the Germans to show up. Uh, well, on the 25th, Christmas Day, uh, there was a battle, but not not that close to us, but we did get some casualties. And when the, I had, we had captured a German ambulance. And uh, besides that, we had our own jeep. And we picked up the casualties and brought them to an aid station in a house where we had a wood stove. And that day, for Christmas, the men could not believe what they were getting. They were getting fresh eggs from the chickens outside there and they were getting uh, uh, ice-cold uh, fruit cup, we put the cans in the river, and uh, let's see, what else did they have? Well, a few other things that they never expected to have. It was a real feast for them. Now, uh, this you'll find most interesting, seeing that uh, we'll talk about a man from Gloversville. On the 7th of January, the 3rd Battalion advanced against very tough German troops. And uh, they got through with the help of Staff Sergeant Frank Sarovica from Gloversville, New York, who got the DSC. He was killed got the DSC on that day, too. Uh, they had been fighting all day, and uh, they still had enough gumps, gumption to, to overcome the Germans mm -hmm. that day. And it was a lot, largely due to this guy. So, in old time, H-O-L-H-E-I-M is a place about three or four miles from there, uh, we got word that uh, they needed medics. But we were in two feet of snow and we had no way to get a, a jeep there or anything like that. We followed at a tank for a little while with a snow plow, and then we took off. We had prisoners. We had an eight man with a 45, and then a prisoner carrying a, a litter and some supplies, and another eight man with a 45, another German, another man with an eight five, another German, and myself behind them with my bow in them. <laughs> and we walked for five miles, we were exhausted. In fact, it fell over on our faces. We were really exhausted, but they needed us very badly up there. You, and if you left the men uh, lay there in the cold, within a matter of uh, a matter of minutes, they may freeze. And if they froze, they die. If you could, they wouldn't bleed as much because of the cold, but. They could die because of the they call the hypothermia. A little later, in the February mud, not too far from Aachen, it, it, the smell was awful because the animals, many animals, cows and horses were dead, and they were on their backs, and their abdomens would rupture. And uh, it was really, uh, 
it really rough there. We had a barn protected cellar at this particular point. And we had, uh, there was a window, but we had the logs, big logs, at this angle so that if any shrapnel came in, it would be deflected. Well, it, we were in the barn, off a house. By the way, every time you were in the barn, it was always off the house. Always in the same place. The kitchen was right off there. And this day, we were looking down towards Germany, looking at the Cologne Cathedral. You could see the spire. And uh, right outside our barn <laughs> was a, a John. Two poster. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I was washing and I could hear pump, pump. That was the 88s coming. They nearly two, two. So, better, better get out of there if we're down in the cellar. When we came back again, uh, the John was gone. Made a direct hit. <laughs> A little later, we were sent to a place called Drew, D-R-E-U-X, for training. And we did quite a bit of training over there, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was rather difficult because we were always on hand in case we had to uh, jump on a, uh, call this place, a prisoner of war camp. And we knew there were several of them. So every time we get ready to go, apparently Patton would get there in time. If we had gone on one that we were supposed to go, we would have been decimated because the troops, so many German troops were there. But uh, they kept busy at this camp and grew and uh, training, uh, athletic training too. I remember they used to play football. Oh, we got no football. So the football for the airborne consisted of a man putting another man on his back. And they'd give the ball, which was a white handkerchief or rag, and he would be the ball, and that guy had to go through. Well, I have a picture of that. And I know I'm there, but you can't see me because the guy on top of me <laughs> had the ball. <laughs> and uh, I was 165 pounds, fairly rugged in those days. and. Uh, I could, you know, I could handle that. So we kept, uh, that day also, we were playing, we were playing ball, we had baseball, and I threw a baseball to the colonel, and he fell and he cut his hand, and I had to uh, send him over to, uh, to the Air Force, Air Force Hospital, not to live by to have it fixed. So that was about the end of our uh, combat. Uh, after that, we went to Schaeff Headquarters, Supreme Allied Headquarters in Frankfurt on Main. And uh, there it was, well, there were meant to be about 180 generals, as many colonels, and a lot of brass, awful lot of brass. And they'd have a, a, uh, a, a mess for captains and lieutenants, and a mess for the non generals, and a mess for generals. One day they had a big party there. I, and, uh, I was with a, an Italian fellow, Joe Palladino, and I had a couple of uh, drinks under my belt, and I was on my third one, and I came to a, uh, a doorway. And I stood there at the doorway. There was a whack talking to an officer. And I looked at him, and I looked down, and he had five stars. I said, Joe, five stars. The man looked up and was Eisenhower. I faded away. You know, was <laughs> That's about the end of it. <laughs> you mentioned something about towards the end you were training after the bulge. Uh, you went training for what? Uh, did you mention something that you guys had to train again? Or oh, when we went to Drew, the R-E-U-X? Yeah. Well, we were training for other missions oh. to, re to jump on the POW camps. Okay, it wasn't yeah. spe special training? No, before. just as they... As they uh, I thought you know, it was for like a special assignment. It wasn't a special assignment, no, it was just routine. 
It was a, it wasn't a special it was a special assignment at the time it came. We never knew when it would come. And at that time, I was the only medical officer with the third battalion, and uh, I was I was getting ready for one of those uh, jumps, and I, uh, I had uh, oh I don't know how many hundred cans of DDT, uh, all kinds of supplies, uh, two jeeps, and. Uh, Two wagons, you know, hauling supplies would come in by glide. I, I had to figure all that by myself. Uh, nobody had help. And uh, uh, medics, of course, but uh, no other officers. So it was a little tough in those days. Well, it's all very interesting. Is there anything else that you can remember about uh, your experiences there? Uh, no, right now I'm just. Uh, <laughs> Out of when you met Eisenhower, what was it? A, what, what was he? You know, uh, was it a mess hall that you met him when you? Oh met? no, it was an officers' club. Oh, an oh, officer's club. two-story officers' club, great and that mess. I see. Okay, but got right, right behind the IG Farben building, mm -hmm. industry building. That's yeah. great. Everything was spit and polished in those days. Great. Then oh. I, I got word that uh, there were. Uh, Getting officers, getting people out because of their points, and I had already a, a com, uh, had a 70 points, so they sent us to Camp Lucky Strike mm -hmm. in Normandy, and, uh, and I took the boat back. Yeah. Well, very good. I want to thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting. I sure appreciate it, and I'm sure people in history uh, and, uh, and will enjoy listening to it. Uh, thank you. I hope so.